Boy, I had a great thesis prepared for this research paper. I had a certain pet theory about the cause of the War of 1812, but unfortunately I found absolutely nothing that would help you to even remotely understand the cause of the war. Although I was able to find on the subject that there is no single cause for the War of 1812, but there were multiple causes, such as the United States being forced to be a veritable pawn of the Napoleonic Wars between Britain and France, our desperate effort to maintain neutrality when Britain wouldn't allow us to trade without a passport, while simultaneously France wouldn't allow us to trade if we had a British passport, the British impressment of American sailors into involuntary service in the British Navy, and all this siphoning our resources that were needed to protect our western border from constant Indian attacks. And all of these supposed reasons for the War of 1812, I found nothing that gave me any valuable information, at least in terms of providing evidence for my own pet theory that the War Hawks in Congress used these aforementioned reasons as a cover for the real goal of taking over Canada for the stated purpose of partitioning the land and selling it to the land prospectors in order to raise money for the federal government. It would be great if I can pull a Governor Ventura and pursue a host of conspiracy theories that need no evidentiary support. The problem is that my original thesis was disproven. In fact, if we have to identify a single cause for the war, we need to look no further than President Madison's war message to Congress dated June 1, 1812. Madison repeatedly cited the impressment of sailors and the infringement of neutral trade with Europe. On June 18, 1812, Congress declared war on Great Britain, authorizing the President to use the whole land and naval force of the United States and commissions to arm vessels, uh, that is, the hiring of privateer vessels to serve as official Navy ships. Now, the Warhawks may, in fact, have decided to take over Canada in order to sell the land, but it is clear that they used the war that was already declared as an excuse to further their desires instead of the other way around. Now, I've reached a bit of an impasse in regards to my original thesis. Should I continue to pursue my idea, for which I know beyond a doubt has no convincing evidence, or should I take a page from my science education counterparts like Richard Dawkins or fellow YouTuber Aaron Ra? and apply the rigors of scientific method to the field of history and social science. Uh, barring from Aaron Ra himself, barring from Dawkins, positive claims require positive evidence. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Adding my own addendum, outlandish claims made without evidentiary support becomes what I like to call donkey proctology. I would have to pull it out of my ass. So following the example of my physical science counterparts, one has only two choices when one's pet theory remains unsupported by laboratorial experimentation. It's not even supported by Wikipedia. A researcher may either A, modify his hypothesis so it comports the evidence gathered, or B, abandon the hypothesis altogether and try to go in a different direction. In this particular circumstance, I chose the second option. The study of history is so vibrant that one can veer in entirely different directions and delve into an interesting and engaging subject. That having been said, my new thesis is much better and of course it supports the evidence that I've gathered during my eventual disproven of the first, that Captain Oliver Hazard Perry is the greatest naval hero in the history of ever and the class of ships that bear his name have carried this proud Navy tradition. My evidence in support of this thesis is as follows. Oliver Hazard Perry was born in 1785 to a family well known for his naval accomplishments. By the time he was 14, he was commissioned a midshipman on board his father's ship during the Quasi-War with France. In 1813, he went to Putnam Bay, Ohio to command the naval forces on Lake Erie. Once there, he proceeded to build a fleet of ships to defend Lake Erie against the British Navy. Let me repeat that for you again, just in case you weren't paying attention the first time. He built his own fleet! Are you kidding me? Can you even imagine what that would look like in today's military? Good morning, Commander Perry. Good morning, sir. We have a new assignment for you. We're sending you off the coast of Somalia to protect civilian ships from fire attacks. Outstanding, sir. What ship am I going to command? No, you're not going to a ship. A short command, then. Excellent. No, I mean your ship hasn't been built yet. Ah, pre-commissioning unit, then. No, you have to build the ship yourself. What? From scratch. What? Without raw materials. What? You'll have to mine the iron ore to smelt the steel to build a ship. Right. You do realize that's impossible, don't you? Ha! You're lucky we're not making you build ten of them. It took him almost a year, a few months more to train the crews, but eventually Perry built as many as ten ships on Lake Erie. There is some minor dispute in that certain sources say they only built nine ships, but this is a mute point. 
as there is consensus that only two ships, the USS Lawrence and the USS Niagara, actually engaged the British in the sea battle that followed. The namesake of the Lawrence is a separate story in itself. On September 10, 1813, almost to exactly two years prior to Francis Scott Key witnessing the defense of Fort McHenry and writing the poem that eventually became our national anthem, British Commodore Robert H. Barclay on board the HMS Detroit challenged the American fleet. The Lawrence was the first to engage the British, and after several hours of intense combat, the Lawrence was destroyed. Perry abandoned ship and rolled out of the Niagara, holding the Lawrence's battle flag, containing the immortal words, Don't give up the ship. Fifteen minutes after Perry shifted his command to the Niagara, the British surrendered. At the end of the battle, 27 Americans were killed and 96 wounded. The British lost 41 sailors and 94 wounded. The Lawrence was the only American ship destroyed while all six British ships were captured, as epitomized in Perry's historical words. We have met the enemy and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. The USS Niagara is reconstructed in 1990 and now serves as a flowing museum and training vessel in Erie, Pennsylvania. In 1819, Oliver Hazard Perry died of yellow fever at sea off the coast of Trinidad and his remains were moved to Newport, Rhode Island in 1825. Of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention Perry's younger brother, Matthew Perry. The other Matthew Perry. Commodore Matthew Perry, who once served under Oliver Perry's command on board the USS Revenge, was called the father of the Steam Navy. He was noted for opening up the nation of Japan for trade. The Lewis and Clark class dry cargo ship USNS Matthew Perry, T aka E9, is named in his honor. The USS Oliver Hazard Perry FFG7 was launched on September 27, 1976, and commissioned on December 17, 1977. She was 453 feet long and 45 feet wide with a navigable draft of 24.6 feet. She was decommissioned on February 20, 1997, and scrapped in December 2005. There have been a total of 71 Oliver Hazard Perry class ships built, 55 in the United States, 2 in Australia, 6 in Spain, and 8 in China. Of these, one was scrapped, Oliver Hazard Perry, the original one, two ships were sunk off the coast of Australia, the HMAS Adelaide and the HMAS Canberra, two ships are mothballed on River to Washington, 16 ships after they were decommissioned were transferred into foreign service. Eight transferred to Turkey, four to Egypt, two to Poland, one to Pakistan, and one to Bahrain. Of the 55 Oliver Hazard Perry frigates built in the United States, four of them, old number 17, 18, 35, and 44, were commissioned by the Australian Navy, meaning the official number of U.S. Navy commissioned Oliver Hazard Perry class frigates is 51. There are eight nations with our frigates currently in service. The United States, Australia, Spain, China, Egypt, Poland, Pakistan, and Bahrain. All of the Oliver Hazard Perry frigates in the United States fleet are named after notable Navy heroes, following the pattern of the Oliver Hazard Perry. To demonstrate this, I can simply summarize the namesakes of the three ships I personally had the privilege of serving aboard during my time in my Navy career. The USS Vandergrift was named after General Alexander A. Vandergrift, the first four-star general of the Marine Corps. General Vandergrift was awarded the Medal of Honor for his heroic actions leading Marines at Guadalcanal, Solomon Islands during World War II. The USS Ford, FOG-54, was named after Navy Cross recipient Gunner's Mate Second Class Patrick Osborne Ford, a patrol boat operator in Vietnam who was killed in action while helping wounded crew members swim to safety. The USS Gary, FOG-51, was named after Medal of Honor recipient Commander Donald A. Gary, the engineering officer on board the USS Franklin during World War II. The ship was operating near Kobe Island, Japan when she came under attack. Commander Gary rescued 200 sailors who were trapped inside the ship, leading them to safety on the weather deck. Afterwards, he went back inside the badly damaged ship in order to lead firefighting and damage control efforts. Pursuant to these heroic actions, the sailors who serve on board Oliver Hazard Perry class frigates strive to maintain the highest standard of professional conduct, the idea being that to serve on board a ship named after, say, a Medal of Honor or Navy Cross recipient means to uphold the fine tradition that the ship's namesake established. This attitude of fortitude and tenacity can be stated no better than a quote from my former commanding officer, Commander R.A. Rogers, during his change of command ceremony. I intend to put this ship into harm's way. 
Ten men and Saturday assumed command, the Vandegrift got underway and deployed to combat operations in the Persian Gulf. It was the fastest and by far the most informal change of command ceremony that I have ever experienced. The Vandegrift and the Gary deployed to Operation Record Freedom with less than 72 hours notice. Such was life in four deploying naval forces. Now well past his third decade of service, the opera has the Perry classes compiled an impressive list of accomplishments. Perry sailors, whichever country they serve or whatever flag they sew into their uniforms, have distinguished themselves in some of the most difficult circumstances that may be asked of a modern sailor. We have been shot at, mined, and hit with missiles. We have been ridiculed, maligned, mocked, and protested. We have been cut, bruised, killed, and thrown overboard. We have faced the ravages of extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme weather, about as often as we have seen spectacular sunset and glass clear water. We have protected shipping, both military and civilian. We have engaged the enemy. We have fought pirates in the Persian Gulf and in the next deployment become pirates of the Caribbean, literally, as we kept American shores safe from narcotics. We have responded to earthquakes, eruptions, tsunamis, hurricanes, even providing our own limited sources to help others in need. We have visited schools, built medical clinics, played with special needs children, and brought toys to orphans. We have faced the enemy and they are ours. The enemy of hunger, the enemy of thirst, the enemy of, of exhaustion, the enemy of constant stress, the enemy of training, qualifications, requalifications, ad infinitum, and the ultimate enemy of family separation. We do all of this for little more than a small service ribbon and a small amount of time to spend with our families. This is typically truncated when the animal, who welcomes his home with a mischievous look in his eye, is fully aware of the next mission coming down the pike. USS Ford returned to Naval Station Everett in Washington State Sunday after spending more than five months at sea. For many military couples, the time away from each other took its toll. It's actually harder on a spouse. This is our first deployment, so it's been harder on her than it has me. Navy officials say most of the crew will get some extra time off to be with their families before reporting back to duty. If I may, I shall close out this essay with yet another quote from then Commander Robert Rogers. In September 2003, when the crew of the Vandegrift was in the middle of its rather routine task of transitioning from one nearly impossible task to another nearly impossible task, with several other nearly impossible tasks just around the corner, Commander Rogers took a few minutes to privately address the ship's company. He made a statement on that day that I will never forget. No matter what else happens from this point forward, you can hold your head high knowing that you have served your country with distinction. We see then that Oliver Hazard Perry's remarkable achievements at the Battle of Lake Erie have been matched by the courage, fortitude, ingenuity, and honor of the crews aboard the ships that have the privilege of bearing his name. I am quite certain that Perry would be proud of his continued naval heritage, but of course I have no evidence for that.